So um, once again, I would like to say, hope everyone is staying well and grounded. It is a great honor for the museum to host today's discussion. Issues of uh, provenance, the history of our work is of primary concern to me personally, as well as my colleagues around countries as museums grapple with the racist and the colonialist structures of uh, that embedded in their founding narratives. And uh, um, before we begin, that once again, uh, uh, um, let's uh, acknowledge that all, all of us and here in San Francisco, the staff, the board of the community, the volunteers uh, have been deeply affected by and engaged in battling the increase in anti-Asian violence in our cities. And the most recent incidents in our country's long history, as I may already mentioned, uh, of scapegoating uh, immigrant and racialized communities in time of uh, crisis. And um, as some of you know that we um, uh, made a, a statements and raise our voices and to, uh, uh, to uh, express our outrage and on this issue. My colleague will post the link uh, in the chat. Sadly, uh, as, um, we also must acknowledge that these anti-Asian attacks have sometimes led to actions that reinforce structures of anti-Black racism, which only departs from the overall goal of racial justice. We denounce this rhetoric and call for unity among all communities, unity among all communities and the coalition building that addresses these systemic issues at their very roots. Um, the murder of George Floyd nearly a year ago inspired many Americans and institutions to look inward. We still have much to do and I hope we can continue to count on the support and input from all of you as we embark on our collective journey to continue to shape the American Asian Art Museum that our community envisions. We are committed to making the Asian Art Museum a place that welcomes and inspires everyone, everyone. And in particular, school-aged children believe that engaging with Asian art and culture in their many forms has the ability to educate, to spark creativity, to force dialogue, to connect people, and ultimately to create change. With that, and uh, I'd like to invite our panelists to join me on screen. Deb will do the honor of introducing everyone, but let me here reiterate my welcome and gratitude to all our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jay, and thank you for your leadership through some, some really difficult times. And it helps the staff to know that you are so um, robustly in support of this internal reflection. And uh, now I'd like to uh, invite all of our panelists to, this, to the stage, if you will, to uh, just have a quick introduction so that um, we can all be together for a minute before we go off into individual presentations and then we will have a panel discussion. Uh, so first we'll be hearing from Zena Barani, the Edith Parada Professor of Ancient Near Eastern Art and Archaeology at Columbia University. Welcome Zainab. And then we'll have uh, Michael Rakowitz, the Alice Welch Skilling Professor of Art Theory and Practice at Northwestern University. Good morning, Michael, or good afternoon, your time zone. And Stephanie Mulder joins us from the University of Texas at Austin, where she's the Associate Professor of Islamic Art, Architecture, and Archaeology. Good morning, Stephanie. And Martina Ruggiati, the Associate Curator and Co-Director of Toka, Towns of the Karakum Project at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Welcome, Martina. And uh, we're also joined, as you see, uh, by our director, Jay Shu, and also the Asian Art Museum's Deputy Director for Art and Programs, Robert Mintz. Um, and so we'll probably hear more from Rob, thank you. The core questions today are around what are blood antiquities and what are the current areas of concern? How are artists responding to looting and the loss and preservation or remaking of cultural heritage? 
how can we shift from a crisis mindset toward more sustainable, sustainable heritage management practices? And how can we learn from the case study of the Afghan reliefs recently reported on in the New York Times? And what advice do the panelists have for museums regarding this consultative care of collections and repatriation role models and what we should strive not to do? So with all of that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to ask um, all the panelists, except for Zainab, to go off screen and mute yourselves. And Zainab um, will begin. Thank you, um, first of all, for inviting me here today um, and for the opportunity to speak about the global market and antiquities. I'm especially um, honored to speak at the Asian Art Museum, uh, particularly because uh, the museum and the director have taken this uh, very important stance uh, against xenophobia and racism. And before we begin, I just want to echo his words and say that I stand in solidarity with everything that he said about the horrendous and um, shocking anti-Asian racism that we've seen and xenophobia in general. Um, and uh, we have to form allegiances um, in order to fight such hatred in the country. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to begin with my first slide. If you can put that on, please. Um, and thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak about the global market and antiquities. I'll focus on the issue as it affects West Asia, uh, the area referred to as the Middle East where there has been a great deal of looting and cultural heritage destruction in recent years. Since the earliest days of the new science of archeology span and the establishment of public museums, first in Europe and then in the United States in the 19th century, there have been three main arguments against the removal and marketing of antiquities, architectural elements and monuments. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, the, fir the first of these arguments is the scholarly argument. Archaeologists have long pointed out that looted artifacts result in destruction of historical and archaeological contexts and information, and that while a work of art, an artifact, or a text, um, while a work of art or an artifact or a text may have uh, knowledge or aesthetic value in itself, the larger archeological scientific context and complex history is destroyed and lost when it is looted. Through looting holes and destructive pits and tunnels across archeological sites, through hacking out parts of reliefs or friezes from larger architectural structures, the extra extraction of antiquities for the market means the co comprehensive destruction of history. Examples of this kind of activity are widespread today, as you can see in the pitted landscape of the site on the upper left of the screen, destroyed by looter holes. Hundreds of sites in the south of Iraq now have this appearance, all as a result of the antiquities trade. But Early archaeologists, we have to uh, point out, also participated in such destruction for the purposes of early museum collecting, most notably for the newly established British Museum and for the Louvre in Paris. Museums in the 19th century and continue, continuing into most of the 20th century saw themselves as salvaging things from, in their words, the barbaric East, the Orient, where people were seen as incapable of either understanding or caring for antiquities. Museums in economically and politically dominant imperial centers could better care for discoveries ma made in the global periphery and regions of colonial occupation. Yet in today's world, new museology 
calls for decolonization and social and restorative justice in museums. These earlier histories of collecting have begun to be confronted. At the same time, we, we are now also addressing the ways in which museum displays in so-called encyclopedic art museums are not neutral spaces, but zones in which cultural and racial hierarchies are performed and perpetuated, in which interpretations of material culture are tied to geopolitical claims of the collecting centers. Questions of provenance and acquisition histories are therefore not limited to our present moment, but have to do with earlier histories of collecting and formations of such collections, which takes us beyond legal claims. I have gone over these points so far because one of the main justifications for collecting antiquities today is still the claim that by doing so, the antiquities are being rescued and salvaged from others who are less capable. As we'll see in the next slide, the second argument against the antiquities market is the legal one. The international legal frameworks that were put in place against the traffic of, trafficking of antiquities are well known. In addition to those, antiquities laws were in place in many of the countries of West Asia beginning in the 19th century. Already in the 19th century, it was illegal to dig or to remove antiquities from Ottoman lands without permission from the sublime port in Istanbul. And the parameters of international law today are powerful arguments against the trading of heritage and antiquities. UNESCO is currently celebrating the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO convention, which bans the import export or transportation of antiquities and cultural heritage. The legal constrictions are nevertheless either ignored or circumvented in many cases. And unfortunately, this has not been limited to trade or to dealing, but practices of some public museums also. Next slide. The most recent example is the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC, established by the Green family owners of the Hobby Lobby in 2017. As several scholars and journalists have pointed out, their acquisition practices, including falsifying information about cuneiform tablets looted from sites in Iraq in order to transport them across borders, labeled as house decor, and their bizarre practice of purchasing ancient mummy masks in order to dissolve them in search of papyrus manuscripts, these are all a breach of both the ethics of conservation and museum stewardship. The collecting practices of this new museum have broken the law. They were required by law to repatriate antiquities to Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East, but they also raise other questions. Next slide, please. So this brings me to the third argument after the scholarly argument and the legal argument, we also have the ethical argument. What does restorative justice in the museum mean? Some objects or some collections were clearly acquired in ways that are outside the international legal framework, as I have said. Artworks and artifacts are now at the center of restitution and repatriation discussions, and in some cases, there seem to be no question that they must be repatriated on legal grounds. But what can we say about situations where the legal restrictions are not at issue, but where the museum might have ethical responsibilities? A good example of such a gray zone is the case of the Virginia Theological Seminary. In their collection was an Assyrian relief from Nimrud acquired for $75 in 1859 from the British excavator, Austin Henry Layard, who was digging in Nimrud. 
It was bought by an American man called Henry Haskell, who legally transported it into the US according to the laws of the time. In 2018, the seminary decided to sell the relief. This was in the immediate aftermath of the ISIS Daesh, who had taken over vast swathes of Syria and Iraq, enslaving hundreds of women's, women and girls and killing thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands of people also became displaced and continue to live in camps today. As ISIS destroyed and blew up major Assyrian sites such as Nimrud and Nineveh, as well as religious shrines, churches, mosques, and minarets, the market price for Assyrian antiquities shot up. The Virginia Theological Seminary, a religious and one would assume ethically grounded institution, apparently decided that this disastrous moment would fetch the best price for the Assyrian relief in their care. They auctioned the relief to the highest bidder and it sold for $31 million to an anonymous private collector. The sale was completely legal. Critics of the sale complained that it was wrong because it went to a private collector and could no longer be seen by the public. Some tweeted that the relief had been illegally acquired in the first place. However, in my view, what is a more important issue is the larger ethical question when the legality of the sale is not in itself a good enough justification for the selling of the relief. The fact that the Virginia Theological Seminary chose this moment to benefit from the disaster that befell the people of Iraq is not a legal matter. The callous indifference of the seminary is perfectly legal, but it is reprehensible nevertheless. The next slide, please. The sale of the Virginia Theological Seminary relief drives up the prices and escalates looting and plunder. The network of trade of antiquities and heritage involves arms trade and violent warfare. In the past few years, it has become clear that it is implicated in slavery and in the killing of people. The market in antiquities results in site destruction and the loss of history, as scholars have made clear, but more importantly, the seemingly elegant and humanist pastime supports a network of violence. Museums today are looking at a sea change before them, partly as a result of growing public awareness around provenance and collecting, the Encyclopedic Art Museum as a neutral space for scholarly knowledge has never been an entirely convincing one, even in the earliest days of its formation. Yet this idea continues to be used to justify collecting. Some argue that museums must continue to collect for the purposes of scholarship and the pursuit of knowledge. But it is unclear why this would be the case when major museums hold thousands of objects and texts that remain unpublished. The museum is meant to be a public trust, and the public now demands stories of provenance that have more transparency and historical displays that don't perpetuate colonial narratives. These are challenging times for museums, but they have the potential for real change. Thank you. That is so inspiring, Zainab. Thank you so much for um, really mapping that out and uh, helping us have a better understanding of the, the justifications that have been made heretofore for collecting this material. And now I'd like to invite Michael to um, show himself on screen and join me here. Yeah, thanks everybody for, for uh, welcoming in, me into your space. Um, I do want to say that uh, I myself am speaking to you today from the unceded land of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miamia, and the Ocheti Shahoin, the Council of the Seven Fires. Um, it is an absolute pleasure and honor to be following Dr. Uh, Bahrani, um, whose words uh, will intersect with my own and um, I'm going to share my screen. 
And um, I wanted to start the talk actually. Um, Dr. Bahrani and I met, I think, can you all see this photo right now? Yes, thank um, you. Great. Yeah, so Dr. Bahrani and I met um, about 14 years ago. And um, you can see doc Dr. Bahrani in the background of this photo with uh, a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Dani Georgiou Khanna, who was the Director General of the National Museum of Iraq and also the President of the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage. Um, Dr. George has since passed away um, in 2011, um, but the projects that I do, I continuously dedicate uh, to his memory and to his efforts in uh, restoring so much of the collection of the National Museum in the aftermath of the looting. And I, what I wanted to point out here was that um, this photograph is not just an intersection of different people that are on the panel right now, but um, this is actually a really, this was a very beautiful moment for me. This was a, a welcome to Dr. George who came to the US after fleeing Iraq. Um, this is uh, January of 2007, when he arrived um, as a visiting professor uh, at the State University of New York at Stony Brook in the Department of Anthropology. And uh, he arrived with his family. And um, here we are at the home of Dr. Sam Paley and uh, Barbara Paley. And the event was to welcome Dr. George and his family, but, uh, but also there was a kind of restitution, a restoration here of all the books that Dr. George had left behind in his library in Iraq to repopulate his collection in his new office in Stony Brook. And, um, and as I follow um, Dr. Bahrani's um, good words about uh, what it means to be here at the Asian Art Museum, I'm thinking about all those moments where restitution and restorative justice can actually intersect. And I'll speak about that more in a bit. Um, I do wanna point out that today's talk is actually being held one week before the 18th anniversary of the looting of the National Museum of Iraq. And so to set the tone, I wanna show these images of the museum in its aftermath. And as we think about what the function of a museum is, and we talk about the trade of antiquities um, to think about the way in which populating an, a museum in one part of the world and populating collections in one part of the world uh, leads to a depopulation of those museums in another. In January of 2020, Nikki Columbus and Claire Bishop published an amazing speculative review of the new MoMA in N Plus One mag magazine. Their positive assessment of the MoMA we should have versus the one we got opened up a new territory where criticism and visionary architecture met. Visionary architecture, while often optimistically broadcasting a desire, is simultaneously rooted in inevitable failure. Typically relegated to models or drawings due to the laws of the city or the laws of gravity, the residual idea nevertheless demands a culture capable of bringing about its existence. When we demand radical change, we're often asked, what will that look like? So I wanted to share with you a proposal that tries to show that the visionary, visionary needn't just be speculative. Versions of the proposal I'm sharing with you now are being, are being seriously considered by several institutions. The proposal has been made in light of the many recent initiatives at encyclopedic museums to invite artists from post-colonial countries to make work in dialogue with antiquities. The context for the proposal is a project I began in 2006 titled The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist. The centerpiece is an ongoing series of sculptures that attempts to reappear, life-size, the 7,000 plus archeological artifacts looted from the National Museum of Iraq. Actually, there were 15,000, but 
about 7,000 still remain at large, um, that were looted during the 2003 US invasion. And the materials that are enlisted are Middle Eastern, West Asian, food packaging, and Arab American newspaper. So it's these fragments of cultural visibility that one finds in the United States where there are Arab populations that are, are being enlisted to make these things that are now no longer visible. In 2015, this project grew to include archaeological sites destroyed by groups like ISIS and the aftermath of the US-led invasion. An example of this is the demolished Lamassu that stood at the Nurgle Gate of Nineveh since 700 BCE, and which I reappeared on the fourth plinth in London's Trafalgar Square in 2018, built from 10,500 empty Iraqi date syrup cans. And in another, in another extension, my studio assistants and I have been faithfully reconstructing each of the rooms in King Ashurnasir Pal II's 9th century BC Northwest Palace of Nimrud, near present day Mosul in Northern Iraq. When exhibited in a gallery or museum, blank spaces are left to indicate the previous removal of certain panels now located in the collections of various Western museums. In winter 2020, I began to wonder how this project could go further to acknowledge the continued history of displacement in Iraq, and more than that, push towards restitution. In response to an invitation from a major American museum to display some of these panels, I sent the following letter. And so I'm going to remove any kind of specificities uh, to protect the anonymity of uh, the people who invited me. Dear Encyclopedic Museum Curator, my apologies for being so late to reply. When he wrote, I was laid up with the flu and after a few days of travel, I received some difficult news about my mother's health. The reliefs from room F from the Northwest Palace of Nimrud that you inquired about will be on view at the National Na Nasher Sculpture Center until early May. So it will certainly be possible for the work to be shown at your museum in the context of the Assyrian reliefs during the time you proposed. But I wonder if we may think more audaciously and provocatively about how to do this. As you know, Daesh's destruction of the Northwest Palace of Nimrud was followed in late 2018 by the auctioning of a relief that was in the possession of the Virginia Theological Seminary. The price paid for this relief, $31 million uh, by an, anom an, an anonymous private collector, was enhanced by the demolition of the palace three years before. And while the money will be used for the purpose of funding a scholarship at the Virginia Theological Seminary, the auction bolstered further the narrative of Iraq as a site of extraction and speculation. I'm hoping that my work can impact and support efforts to interrupt this cycle. In the past few years, I've been focusing more on institutional responsibility and my commitments as an artist, descended from an Iraqi Jewish mother forced to depart her homeland. A desire to return despite its impossibilities fuels so much of my practice. A multitude of Iraq's cultural heritage now exists outside of its borders, away from its people, and what remains has been targeted for destruction. But what perishes is not just the monumental release of colossal figures of deities like the Lamassu, it is the communities of people who live alongside them. The DNA of those lives cannot be 3D printed and replaced. That is why I've come to call my works not reconstructions, but reappearances or ghosts of the original. An imperfect and vulnerable offering that will one day also disappear. Let me say without hesitation that it would be a pleasure to collaborate with you on this project. But in order to do this, I'd like to up the ante and create a more complex agreement. I'd like to gift the museum the entirety of room F section one, free of charge, 
in exchange for the return of your museum's panel from room F. Given all that has been destroyed in Iraq, the intersection of that destruction with the West's insatiable appetite for the objects of the East, while not always, if ever, extending the, that, that concern to its people, this return of an original would be more than just restitutive. It would be restorative. So much is missed when our conversations around decolonization rest only on questions of repatriation. I liken this to the inadequacy of apology versus accountability. Apology, when uttered, unburdens the person saying it more than it heals the person to whom it was directed. But true accountability is an ongoing repair through discourse and reckoning. It is never finished. Restoration exists as a practice within every museum that I have known. In fact, when I visited your museum in January, the director took me to the area where some of the reliefs were being restored. I was so moved to see the backs of the reliefs. In that moment, the apkalu were like figures in the round. I was seeing the relief as if it had turned its back on me, as if it were walking away, going home. Please understand the absolute sincerity of my proposal here, and please do not perceive this as only a vilification of the museum, the work you do, or some kind of unkind purity judgment of the museum's collections. The best one can hope for in doing any kind of work is that it will continue to teach and that we will be open to learning. We know that museums are important and at their best, they can be used on a mutual curiosity among the world's culture. But we cannot ignore the cultural traumas caused by of the, ex, of the extraction of many of these objects, nor the imperative to break this cycle and restore dignity and humanity to the people that have been parted from their cultural heritage. For a long time, I thought I was making these reappearances to replace what was destroyed in Iraq. I imagine that one day perhaps my reappearances might end up in places like Nineveh, Nimrud, Mosul, or Baghdad. Yet what was destroyed in Iraq was disappeared in part because the West valued it so much. And so I wish to complicate my work even more by acknowledging that a ghost needs to haunt. It is not, however, the Iraqis who need to be haunted. It is us. I thank you for reading this and hope you and the museum will think seriously with me on this proposal. Sincerely, Michael. Wow, I'm um, incredibly moved and I hate to ask what happened next. Um, I think that's probably a burning question for many of the folks gathered here and I'm wondering uh, if you'd like to say anything about that. Well, you know, to, to protect the proposal, because um, there are various places that are truly considering it, um, I will say that um, that I'm, I'm inspired by the bravery of some of the institutions that are actually considering it. Um, I have run up against larger institutions that are wringing their hands and and more or less repeating, you know, these racist um, excuses of like, you know, if we give it back, who do we give it to? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is such bullshit. Uh, for me, we know that there's people to receive them. Mm -hmm. And the bureaucratic um, hurdles are often about shipping. Right. Um, and those are things that these uh, these imperial museums that are in the global north and in the west can certainly afford as a form of re of, of restoration. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing so much of what Professor Bahrani pointed out before, which was, you know, there 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 is a recycling of, of the kind of uh, racist argument of colonial largesse, which is about you know the west suddenly taking care of it. And, you know, when the Lamassu actually, um, you know, it was up for two years in, the, in, in London and, and it came down. And, um, 
and I was approached by the Tate Modern who wanted to be um, considered as a custodian of the work. And when I thought about the wound that that work looks to keep alive and visible, you know, I realized that I didn't want to just reinforce, you know, the um, the 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 West being seen as 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 repositories for this work. Right. And so I wanted to introduce something that was a little bit more unresolvable in the loan agreement, and to say that you know this is a diasporic object with wings you know, that's actually capable of flying between places. And if I think about the modern context of people who come from places like Palestine and the Iraq and Syria, they're in these places that are not fixed. And I mean fixed in two different ways, fixed in terms of not being able to locate, but also fixed in terms of, you know, the, the way in which has been continuously fragmented. And so that leads to a life where one is always between places. And so I asked the Tate Modern if they would, um, you know, in, enter into an agreement with an Iraqi institution so that neither has a controlling share and that the work continues to go back and forth. And they, they agreed. And they also agreed to kind of, you know, low key lobby, you know, the other institutions in Britain um, to say, well, look at this, we got another Lama Sioux. It's time for one of the ones that are in our museums to go back. And that's where it gets really tricky, you know, because then you end up with these arguments from people that are in those institutions who will say, well, we're very proud of the fact that we allowed Facta Marte to come in and do a 3D scan of the Lama Sioux and they printed it out and they put the perfect patina on it. It looks exactly like the thing that's in our museum. And they sent these hollow things, these shells uh, to these institutions in Northern Iraq. And I'm thinking to myself, why the hell you know, if they're so satisfying, then give the originals back, you know? And, and so for me, that, that's the possibility that like everyone is, is rushing towards 3D printing as if it's some kind of way in which to free up this argument. Um, but it, it, what's still being very much exposed is, is this, this kind of colonial, uh, this colonial attitude that allowed for these works to be extracted in the first place. Right. Wow, there is a question in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, if you could elaborate on the sketch behind you, I think you talked about it at the beginning of your talk and how it connects uh, and intersects with your letter. Help us connect the dots there. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the sketch that's in the background is my favorite work that's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and. And yeah, I'll bend over so you can see it a little better. But um, but this is a work by Yona Friedman. Um, it's called La Ville Spatiale, and it was uh, made in 1958-59. And as an artist that comes from this world also of design and architecture, I love Yona Friedman's uh, plans for cities because they're radical. And they envision you know a, a city that has this kind of like a network or a structure that allows for it to respond to the free will of the people living in it to build their own structures. So you see this kind of fanciful hammock, you know, kind of house, and then these other pieces. But importantly, it proposes the city that builds vertically so that in order to expand, one never displaces what came before. And if I think about MoMA and these other museums that I feel have broken my heart, you know, as these repositories for these radical visions. And I think about the displacements of communities that have happened um, in the way in which art is weaponized to justify those displacements. This work for me is like one of these works that I feel is almost being damaged, you know, by, by the way in which, you know, MoMA is basically this place that's run by this predatory and extract extractionist um, uh, billionaire class on, on the board. And I almost feel like these are the works that also need to be restored. Mm. So even within collections, there's, um, there's harm being done. I believe so, yes. And I think we can make that, that argument because I do think that you know, these works um, also demand the kind of restoration of intention and mm. vision. Mm. Um, but thank you so much for uh, a very provocative and um, 
I don't know, heart-wrenching and beautiful presentation. Well, thank, thank you for having me and, and my deepest thanks and admiration to my, my, my fellow panelists. Okay, so we are going to um, turn now to Stephanie Mulder. Right, thank you, Deb, and um, thank you to Jay and to everyone who um, put this panel together. I think it's such a, it's for me, it's really an honor to be here, and I'm, I'm still kind of processing um, your talk, Michael, that was very moving, and it feels a, bit, a little bit like a hard act to follow in some sense, but I hope that some of the themes that I draw out pertain to, um, to the idea of restorative justice and how we might pursue that through a close examination of our ideas about what heritage is and, um, and how we have conceived of heritage and how we might begin to reconceive it. So my talk is called Moving Beyond the Heritage in Crisis Model, and I've put this in um, quotation marks for a reason that I think will become apparent as I speak. Um, my goal here is to begin thinking about, um, at, well, really, to I think I should really be honest about saying that I want to highlight some of the work of some of my colleagues who have already begun to think about how we can conceive of more sustainable models for, for cultural heritage. My background is as an archaeologist and an art historian, um, so I, I'm not somebody who's directly specialized in cultural heritage, but I worked for over 12 years in Syria and um, came to care very deeply about the fate um, primarily of the people who are my friends um, and colleagues in this region, but um, of course also about the um, objects of, of cultural heritage, which are deeply meaningful to them uh, as well. Um, so I'll begin by just um, taking us to the opening lines of the UNESCO 1972 Convention um, on the Protection of World Cultural and Natural Heritage, which begins with a seemingly innocuous statement one that's apparently so self-evident that we rarely think to question it. Quote, noting that the cultural heritage and the natural heritage are increasingly threatened with destruction. And it goes on to enumerate some of the forms of destruction that, that face um, cultural and natural objects. The convention, which in Arts Article 11 goes on to establish the creation of UNESCO's list of world heritage in danger, had the aim of putting in place the international legal framework by which we still define cultural heritage. And it remains a key metric for defining the heritage value of sites threatened by war and conflict. Yet the UNESCO model is based on a series of premises that while seemingly benign, universal and neutral, in fact, encode a series of ideas about heritage that in recent years have led directly to the destruction of heritage and to the circulation of objects like the marble panels from Ghazni on the global antiquities market. Today, I'd like to briefly examine the notion of universal heritage to, yes, unpack all of the assumptions that are hidden in this tweet. In case you are wondering why this conversation is still necessary, you should note that this tweet was put out by UNESCO's Unite for Heritage account, which is meant to appeal to a younger group of um, people interested in cultural heritage, almost exactly three short years ago. Unlike UNESCO, I will argue that while the dominant universalist model of heritage preservation in which heritage is envisioned as a property-based model that belongs, quote, to all humanity, end quote, has accomplished a great deal. It has also been an important motivation for the destruction of heritage in wartime and in the alienation of, uh, of local communities from their heritage following reconstruction. It has also fueled the narrative in which heritage is framed as worthy of, it, of action only when in crisis, a narrative fueled by recent conflicts in the Middle East with its origins, in fact, in the conflict in Afghanistan. While a few short years ago, these conflicts focused much attention on the heritage violence waged by the militant group ISIS as they destroyed statues in the museum in Mosul, those events created a tidy narrative of the destruction of global heritage that overlooked a key fact, namely that prior to their arrival in the museum, 
ISIS had spent eight full months destroying the numerous, cultural, numerous culturally and aesthetically significant locally valuable sites and objects and met little international outcry. In fact, their actions only made international headlines when they began smashing the statues in the museum at Mosul. Why should that be? Arguably, the shrines and tombs and churches that ISIS destroyed prior to the museum destruction were more valuable, or at least as valuable, to the living people of Mosul as the statues in the museum. They represented important sites of Muslim, Jewish, and Christian worship. Some of them were over a millennium old, and some of them were works of spectacular architectural and aesthetic achievement. But we only really paid attention when that museum video appeared. I would propose that the heritage in crisis model has in fact both contributed to the destruction of monuments and to their circulation on the global antiquities market. What was it that made us respond on this deeply personal emotional level to the destruction of objects, of statues we'd never seen, from a civilization many of us had barely heard of, in a museum most of us will never visit? And related to this question, was that response precisely the one that ISIS wished to elicit? I'm going to answer this question with another one, one recently posed by my colleague, Wendy Shaw. How old are antiquities? The answer, I think, lies in an unexpected place, not in a history book, nor in the pages of an ancient papyrus, nor in the careful dating sequences of an archaeologist. Instead, the answer lies in the intellectual and legal construct that the majority of us rarely question, the notion of global cultural heritage. In other words, if we want to ask how old antiquities are, we have to ask ourselves where our contemporary conception of what constitutes antiquities comes from in the first place. Because clearly, judging from the world's differing response to various kinds of cultural heritage destruction performed by ISIS, not all antiquities, not all old, beautiful things are necessarily considered cultural heritage. The official story of the creation of the idea of cultural heritage is well known, but it's worth remembering that it begins far more recently than many of us realize. Less than 70 years ago, in the aftermath of World War II, as Europe began to confront the devastating humanitarian and cultural catastrophe that the war had left behind. In the aftermath of the war, a sequence of international human rights laws were drafted, finally codified by the newly founded United Nations in 1948 in the form of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was part of the, UN, of the original UN Charter. The deliberate destruction of cultural heritage was originally written into the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, though it would be another decade until the signing of the Hague Convention in 1954, until there was a universally recognized concept of cultural heritage as a human right. That definition has now developed over the course of several later statutes and rulings into a legal framework defining global cultural heritage. Along with that legal definition came a popular conception that certain ancient monuments that are part of this newly minted idea of global heritage of humankind, representing humanity's highest cultural, intellectual, scientific, and artistic achievements, ought to be singled out for special protection. Today, if you open the website of UNESCO, you will find a definition that argues that monuments, buildings, and sites that UNESCO determines possess, quote, outstanding universal value, end quote, are those that are placed on its world heritage list, a heritage that belongs to all humankind. What this means is that for many Western observers, when ISIS hacked away at those sculptures in the Mosul Museum, it was hacking away not at a few effigies of a long lost Iraqi king, but as their, at their highest ideals as human beings. The creation of this notion of what we might call heritage consciousness is without question a signal achievement. Arising out of the ashes of nationalism gone awry at the end of World War II, it was part of a broad vision of international collaboration that heralded a new era of global cooperation. 
In the last few decades, it was pursued largely through the mechanism of the UNESCO's World Heritage List, which quickly became the gold standard for, tour for the tourism industry, as well as for the promotion of distinct national identities. While this may not seem so bad at first blush, consider just one example of how a destructive form of nationalism can be put to the service of very problematic ideals, an attempt by the Cambodian government to get world heritage status for the former Khmer Rouge stronghold of An Long Bang, where the ashes of totalitarian dictator Pol Pot rest, a site that is still heavily landmined. Most of us would agree that this is a strange vision for global heritage, but it is an illustrative one for how sought after UNESCO heritage status has become and for how the national narratives that it may enshrine can be deeply problematic, particularly for national minorities. And the rise of heritage consciousness has had another unexpected outcome. ISIS's highly mediatized spectacles of destruction appeared designed to achieve two goals, to perpetuate acts of cultural cleansing against local populations, but also to challenge and defy Western cultural ideas surrounding the quote, universal value of heritage. ISIS used cultural destruction as a weapon as a means of capturing media attention and to project a propagandistic message that Western and local governments were powerless to stop their advance. In other words, destroying the past was, just as it had been for combatants in World War II, a means of signaling their power and brutality. In other words, the heritage in crisis model had been hijacked as a weapon against the West and its perceived values. And in fact, the deliberately orchestrated visual spectacle of ISIS's destruction of cultural heritage and its rapid dissemination on the internet became a powerful recruitment tool and a potent propaganda mechanism for the group. The amplification of their actions by the Western media, as well as our participation as a horrified but captive audience did nothing to stop it. In fact, it only served to further their goals. This image, for example, became the iconic media representation for the destruction of the Syrian site of Palmyra. What does it mean that this is an image taken by an ISIS photographer, but reproduced and virally shared in the global media as though it were a journalist's photograph? Does it not mean that we all became participants in and consumers of ISIS propaganda? ISIS officially framed their actions as an expression of iconoclasm in the theological sense, in their words, by following in the footsteps of the prophet Muhammad in destroying ancient statues as an act of religious pietism. But they were also challenging the Western global heritage discourse, which they did by means of direct analogy with their purported theological aims. In other words, by framing Western heritage uh, uh, veneration as a secular form of idolatry and their actions as destroying the objects of Western heritage worship. It is worth emphasizing that there is little evidence for any pattern of deliberate ideologically motivated heritage destruction in Islamic history prior to ISIS. In fact, as colleagues and I have recently argued, Islamic communities have rich and complex traditions for preserving and interpreting antiquities, according ruins, educational, spiritual, or religious significance. Thus, despite their claims, ISIS was not engaged in any particularly Islamic activity when it destroyed ancient sites. Instead, it was engaged in a very modern one, one related to the global heritage discourse. In this, they were following a recent precedent set by the Taliban, who carried out a similar act of mediatized cultural heritage destruction when they demolished the Bamiyan Buddhas in 2001. In fact, the Taliban had made a revealing argument about the Western heritage discourse with respect to the Bamiyan destruction. Initially, the Taliban leader Mullah Omar had argued that the Buddha statues should be preserved to provide tourist revenue, but later, claiming that Western aid organizations seemed more concerned about the fate of the statues than that of the Afghan people who were then experiencing a severe famine. 
he decided to destroy the statues in order to bring international attention to what he perceived as the misplaced values of the international community, values that accorded more significance to dead stones than to living people. 15 years later, having closely observed the international outcry after the destruction of the Buddhas, ISIS had simply taken the Taliban's logic to its ultimate conclusion. This quite recent apocalyptic conception of heritage as a Western cultural idol worthy of iconoclasm, thus makes the destruction of heritage perfectly intelligible and rational. Heritage destruction is now a means of perpetrating an act of ideological warfare in an asymmetrical conflict against more militarily powerful Western enemies. And the theme is now well established. In Mali, Islamist rebels claimed there is no world heritage. It does not exist. The infidels must not get involved in our business. Such statements should bring our attention into sharp focus, for they reveal the limits of the notion of the universality of heritage and illuminate how that very framework can itself be turned into an ideological weapon. In response to these concerns, a changing model for the nature and definition of heritage in post-war recovery is being framed within the fields of archaeology and heritage management. It's characterized by this strong critique of 20th century universalist models of heritage in the aftermath of rebuilding from recent conflicts, and it's rapidly evolving in the context of the post-2003 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as more recent conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Mali. This shift is developing in the context of new theoretical understandings of how the concept of heritage is created and maintained in popular consciousness, a phenomenon the anthropologist Lara Jane Smith has termed the, author the authorized heritage discourse. The authorized heritage discourse is a set of often unexamined assumptions about the definitions and meanings of heritage that promote a certain group of Western values as if they were universally applicable. The authorized heritage discourse typically privileges monumentality and grand scale, innate artifact site significance tied to time depth, scientific and aesthetic expert judgment, and social consensus and nation building. And it deprivileges local and non-expert understandings of heritage. Although the conception of world heritage as promoted by UNESCO and other organizations, as well as by many archaeologists, is often positively received, is viewed by some observers, and in the cases of, of ISIS and the Taliban, uh, also by some uh, combatants, as an extension of the colonial project, traveling to knowing and mapping territories outside of one's own national boundaries. Furthermore, it values notions of property ownership that may not always be relevant for local communities. As Lynn Meskel has said, the language of the UNESCO conventions reinforces Western notions of value and rights, while the ownership and maintenance of the past is suffused with concepts surrounding property. And yet for many local people, sites of heritage are not conceived within a framework of ownership or property, but as sites of shared communal, ancestral, and social significance. This critique illuminates the way that global models of heritage are not truly global in their conception and implementation, but in fact, largely derived from Western post-enlightenment frameworks and definitions. What does all this have to do with heritage at risk? A very great deal, it turns out. Because when we define heritage in crisis or heritage at risk, um, as what spurs international heritage bodies, museums, and publications to action, we all too frequently replicate the values of the authorized heritage discourse and de-emphasize the values of local communities, frequently privileging actions that primarily ben benefit Western heritage ideals. As I noted at the beginning, this was all too, uh, all too evident in the differing international responses to ISIS's destruction of local sites versus museum objects in Iraq and Syria. The recreation of the Arch of Palmyra by Oxford University's Institute for Digital Archaeology and Dubai's Museum of the Future Foundation unveiled in Trafalgar Square against the backdrop of the neoclassical portico of the National Gallery by Boris Johnson in 2016, just five years ago, reinforced universalist claims to Syria's ancient heritage. Yet the cost of the, of the project 
$143,000 raise the question of who benefits from such performative acts of heritage consciousness. It certainly wasn't the people of the modern living city of Todmore near the ruins of Palmyra, nor the families of the more than 240 Syrians killed during the ISIS occupation of the city, including the site's, um, including the site's uh, chief archaeologist, Khaled al-Assad. Nor was it the Syrian heritage workers who rushed to protect Syria's sites from destruction, not by ISIS, but by the far more devastating uh, incursions of the Syrian government's barrel bombs. And images like this one also allow Western politicians to appear as heritage saviors. Sorry, my slides are a little out of order. Obscuring the role that Western powers play in perpetuating conflicts in the region in the service of their geopolitical goals. The very conflicts that fuel the entry of antiquities into the market. And in the case of some objects like the Ghazni marbles directly into Western museum collections. It's a form of heritage action the Iranian-born media artist Morishin Aliyari calls violent care. To close, we might ask how many now remember the devastation caused by ISIS? Six years after the conflict, many of my undergraduate students don't. Of course, they were only 12 years old at the time, but their amnesia brings into focus another problem of the heritage in crisis model, that it focuses attention on heritage only when it is in crisis. Once the headlines fade, so does the popular and political will to solve what are deeper systemic problems of destruction by neglect, looting of archaeological sites, and the circulation of objects on the antiquities market. A crisis, after all, is a temporary thing. It passes and the attention of the world moves on. So what can be done? If universalist models of heritage value have played a role in alienating local people from their heritage, and in some cases even led directly to heritage destruction, and if this model often privileges Western values in the guise of universalism, how can we put these observations into action to create more inclusive ways of engaging with heritage? particularly for portable objects like the Ghazni marbles uh, that circulate on the antiquities market. Collectors, museums, and ordinary people play a pivotal role in changing these discourses. While local people under duress from war, conflict, and poverty often practice subsistence looting as a strategy for survival, it's, it's not only they, it's not they who fuel the demand. The market for antiquities is, after all, a market driven primarily by museum goers and collectors in wealthy nations. Collectors often feel that by purchasing antiquities, they are saving objects that would otherwise be endangered by war. Yet the problem is that every purchase inevitably fuels the market and thus fuels further looting. Collectors then have powerful agency in dictating what the market demands. And museums too play an important role. Since museums typically hold the vast majority of their collections in storage, they can slow this market by curtailing new acquisitions, as recently has been done at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Near Eastern section, and instead create exhibitions out of their already substantial collections. Perhaps it is time to abandon the ideals of comprehensiveness and propose that many museums, in fact, may have enough. In addition to being transparent about the difficult histories of objects, museums could also work creatively with archaeologists and with local communities to redirect purchasing budgets towards sponsoring local archaeological education. For example, Morag Pearsall's Follow the Pots project or initiatives like the Smithsonian sponsored Turquoise Mountain Collective, which brings the work of contemporary Afghan artists to a global art market. And individuals too play a crucial role in holding our institutions accountable. By demanding that museums present complete provenance information, the histories and sale and purchase of objects, you too can do your part to ensure that people around the world can find a future in the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That um, was such a great way to problematize our understanding of cultural heritage. And also thank you for offering these very um, positive steps that institutions can take.
let me share my screen and open my PowerPoint. Um, thank you very much. I'm very, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, invited by the Asian Arts Museum uh, in San Francisco. And I am really in, uh, in awe of, of, of the commitment shown by the museum on issues of social justice um, and towards creating real change. I hope, and I feel very humbled to be speaking after my um, uh, esteemed colleagues uh, and panelists who really helped uh, set the frame of uh, what so the story that I want to tell you today, which is a little bit more um, uh, focused. So as uh, Deb Clearwater, uh, whom I also thank for organizing this panel, as, as Deb mentioned uh, at the very beginning, uh, on uh, March 4, there was a New York Times Magazine article, very well investigated uh, by Matt Akins uh, on the antiquity trade of Afghan marbles. And the day after, so just a few weeks ago, I received emails from a curator and the deputy director of the Asian Art Museum asking me if I know anything about, if I know about this uh, panel, which has been in the collection since 1987. And, um, I do know something because I have been um, this panel together with other uh, a thousand similar pieces were part of my um, PhD uh, research and dissertation, which I um, completed in 2007. Um, when I, well, it's been almost 20 years that I work on this group of uh, of objects. Um, um, for the dissertation, I had digitized and classified a 50 year old archives, uh, archive of photos and documents of the Italian archeologists who had worked uh, in Afghanistan um, in the 1950s and, and 60s. And in fact, the information on this uh, specific slab was already in an Asian art museum's record because I had visited in 2009 and I had shared then uh, the data I knew uh, uh, with uh, the colleagues uh, there. I was, um, I was doing research uh, for my postdoc then uh, when I, I basically was visiting collections where I had traced the presence of Ghazni marbles and um, so large numbers. Uh, large number of private and public collections or private collections uh, in London and Kuwait City, uh, public collections, museums in Brooklyn, Princeton, uh, Stuttgart, Bamberg, Bamberg, Copenhagen, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Paris, uh, and San Francisco, but there will be more coming up uh, as uh, 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 objects appear on the market or in, uh, um, in exhibitions. All these um, institutions hold panels that I was able to identify in the photographs taken um, in the original location in Ghazni in the 1950s and 60s. And um, by then in 2009, when I was visiting San Francisco, I had already worked in, in Afghanistan in, at the National Museum of, uh, uh, Ka of Afghanistan in Kabul with the Afghan and Italian colleagues to identify the marbles and other Ghazni artifacts that have remained um, in the country. The panel that is currently in the Asian Art Museum, um, let me describe it a little bit for you. Uh, as you can see, it's carved in a bas relief and shows three uh, different registers. I hope that you can see my mouse here. Um, in the upper register, we have an inscription in a very mm, e elegantly placed uh, um, foliated Kufic script, uh, and the inscription is a part of a Persian poem. The central register shows a very um, articulate uh, sequence, a continuous sequence of interlaced uh, trifoil motifs or arches uh, on a background of uh, continuous uh, vegetal uh, patterns. And we have also like on the lower register, a uh, double sequence of, uh, of interlaced scrolls. And the label of the Asian Art Museum rightly says that uh, the object was made in Ghazni between the end of the 11th and the beginning of um, the, the first quarter of the 12th century um, of the current era. So on March 5th, um, then a few days later, I spoke with the curators and they asked me, 
if they knew the history of the panel and uh, how did it arrive uh, in the US? And my answer was yes and, and no. Uh, I know something about it, thanks to this um, archive. The panel was photographed in 1958 and then again another time in 64, 67, inside a mausoleum in the Western cemeteries of Razni. You can see uh, the photographs are not of very good quality because this photographic archive, despite being in the northern, in, in the global north, uh, in Rome, it's also in, in danger. And uh, this is a, a decayed uh, printed photograph. Um, so you can see yellow. So this is the panel of the currently in San Francisco. And you can see that it's placed on the, as a pedestal of, uh, uh, of a, tomb in marble, of which you can see here one, one corner. The Italian archaeologists were recording all the medieval marbles preserved in the town. Um, they also, in this case, recorded the name of the building as a sanctuary or ziara, Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Saheb. Um, we don't know if uh, um, the location of this uh, building. Can you see me correctly? Because I'm, I'm told that my connection is not working very well. Um, you, your, your voice is coming through and your camera is a little bit um, you know, wobbly. So keep going. Would you, we'll would you, you know. prefer me to cut off the camera? Let me know. Um, yeah, I'll let you know. Right now it seems oh, okay. But thank you. Thanks. But we, we don't know what happened to this panel after the last time it was photographed in the 1960s and before 1987. Um, however, we do know something about the other panels, the in total six panels that were photographed together in this uh, ziara. Um, one is today in the, in the Linden Museum in Stuttgart, and the other one is the, in the Art Museum of the Princeton uh, uh, University. The one in Francisco and the Inchis soon after the beginning of the Afghan wars uh, and the one now in Princeton arrived even later in 2001. Martina, do you mind um, restating that last uh, sentence because you broke up and maybe going off camera will have a better connection. Yes, let me stop the video first and go back one slide. Here we are. So um, we know that the, the panel in San Francisco and the one in Stuttgart arrived there in the 1980s, while the panel in, uh, in Princeton arrived only in 2001. So the first uh, two panels uh, uh, arrived in museums uh, soon after the beginning of the Afghan wars. The city of Ghazni is in southern Afghanistan, about 140 kilometers south of Kabul. The town um, is pretty large. It almost doubled in size a couple of years ago following a, a refugee crisis. It now has a population of 270,000. Um, it has a university and also an American and Polish military base. Um, for the country of Afghanistan, the Soviet invasion of 1979 has marked the beginning of uh, this uh, decades-long period of conflicts uh, that are in part still ongoing in different degrees. One of the, of the features of the, of the landscape surrounding the modern city of Ghazni today is the constellation of cemeteries and, and tombs. Some are, are recent, unfortunately. They have increased uh, widely during the wars, which have had a really uh, difficult toll on, on Ghazni. Many of these tombs instead go back to the medieval period. Um, and, and most of them uh, belong to historical figures, to poets, uh, to Sufis and saints. There is a tentative mapping of uh, uh, the current uh, location of some of these mausolea here in this map. 
Some of the tombs are within uh, very large buildings and mausolea. Uh, sometimes uh, um, they are uh, just enclosures uh, surrounding them. And they, these are called ziarat. Visiting these places is an act of devotion uh, to pray for the defunct, to ask for grace uh, and to receive uh, blessing. Mm, a series of pious of devotional acts that are known to have been performed with obvious big differences since at least the, the 11th century. Uh, we know, for example, that Himut Sultan Babur in the 16th century uh, visited uh, the tombs in Ghazni, the author of a Persian poem on Ghazni in the 17th century. Uh, even Muhammad Iqbal, uh, the poet of the East and Muslim reformer, visited the tombs in 1933. They, they all mentioned these tombs as being the blessed tombs where, uh, quote unquote, from the 17th century poem, Saad Hezaran Sufi, 100,000 Sufi rest. So a very uh, sacred landscape. One of the most revered tombs is that of the medieval mystic poet Hakim Sanai. Uh, another one is of, the Sultan, of Sultan Mahmoud, which you can see here on the uh, photograph in the, on, on the right. Most of these buildings, as well as mosques, uh, are of more in Ghazni, are of modern or recent reconstruction, but they often display marbles, um, carved marbles, that date back to Ghazni's uh, pre modern past. Uh, at a time between the 11th and the 15th century, when the city was um, the main capital of uh, two um, local but important uh, regional dynasties, reigns that of the Ghaznavid and the Ghurid. Uh, and the Ghurid, uh, the Ghaznavids at a certain point um, were ruling um, an, uh, a region ex extending from central Iran all the way to the uh, subcontinent, to the Indus River. Marbles uh, that were carved in this period uh, display uh, inscriptions in Arabic and in Persian, um, interlace geometrical and vegetal patterns, uh, um, some other uh, that are held in Afghanistan's museums as well as abroad today also have uh, figural representations. So all in all, we are talking of a very complex visual culture in Ghazni in, in the medieval time. So the San Francisco panel is one of these medieval objects reused in, uh, in a sanctuary. The Italian archaeologists left, uh, left this panel and the other ones in the Ziara Imam Sahib, where they, they photographed it. Uh, as uh, at the time, they were not dismantling artifacts from active sanctuaries because they had other goals. Um, they, they, they did something also, uh, something different, but also quite destructive. Uh, they started an archaeological dig. which you can see uh, here. They were interested basically in the medieval period of the city and, and, and then uh, excavated an early 12th century palace, which they found out uh, was built for the Ghaznavid Sultan Masud III at the beginning of the 12th century, as I said. Um, and you can see here a map showing this very large courtyard all paved in marble that is uh, also photographed here in the central uh, image. Around this courtyard, uh, a long um, dado carved in marble was inscribed with a poem in Persian. Um, and you can see here in these photographs how many of these slabs from this dado were found in their original uh, co-location in, in the palace. It is likely that the San Francisco panel was also made, uh, was made to be part of this data originally, as also the slabs in Stuttgart and Princeton. And this is because their size, material inscription and uh, iconography are, are indicative of this, um, of this link. At some point after the repurpose of the palace for other services, uh, probably in the 13th century or later, these panels uh, were reused to decorate the pedestal of a tomb, probably a pious gesture by an unnamed individual to further elevate the space of the Ziara Imam Fahib, 
with the, to elevate it maybe with the memory of, of a blessed royal past of Ghazni. Um, what is interesting to note is that this might have happened in the same moment for these three, at least for two of these slabs in the, in the Ziara, because uh, um, uh, the, these two panels, the one in Stuttgart and the one in San Francisco, uh, were originally contiguous in the, in, in the dado. Uh, Viola Leganzi has recently shown with a study of the poem how they constitute a continuous verse and also the, the pattern um, coincides. Um, I don't know anything about when and how the panels left the funerary building, nor when they left Afghanistan or where to before uh, being before the one was gifted to the San Francisco Museum. The evidence, however, points towards sometime after the Soviet invasion, maybe in the early 1980s. And uh, I am glad to Zainab to have, uh, um, and to Stephanie to have gone into the legal issues. Uh, here we have an absence of, of documentation apparently, which unfortunately suggests that the export happened illegally according to both Afghan laws and the UNESCO Convention of 1972 on the export of, uh, of cultural heritage. But what happened to the marbles which stayed in Afghanistan during the wars? The excavated palace had become an open air museum which had opened in 1966, showcasing all the 44 dado panels found along the courtyard. Sometime after the start of the war, so late 70s, early 80s, 23 of these panels were safely moved to storages and museums in Afghanistan. And I traced uh, other panels uh, today in Paris, in Kuala Lumpur, and in Kuwait. So there is about 20 of these that are still missing. Um, on the other hand, the marbles in the museums uh, uh, were protected by the citizens of Ghazni uh, together with the Buddhist artifacts of the pre-Islamic past of the town. I was told the story in Ghazni, uh, and this is uh, not a unique story to Ghazni. There are similar ones that uh, uh, one can collect uh, in Afghanistan and I'm sure in, in other uh, war-torn countries as well. So the citizens of Ghazni filled the storage space before, like an empty room before the place where the, the marbles, where the artifacts were, were stored with broken furniture up to the ceiling uh, to effectively discourage rampant Taliban's who desired to perform some act of, uh, of destruction. So there is, there, there are missing objects from the museums in Afghanistan, uh, today and they will probably appear in the future on the market. Um, but in, in all in all, only a limited number of those uh, uh, who are held in the museums in the 70s are unaccounted for today. The New York Times Magazine article showed that uh, an investigation of the antiquity market for these pieces can reconstruct the missing part of the story. For example, of the dado from this year of uh, Imam Al-Sahib. And I'm really grateful to Matt Akins for his rigorous work on, on the piece. Uh, but for me, uh, what is more important, and I speak here as an archeologist and a curator, is to explore possible futures for this and, and for the other artifacts that arrived on the antiquity market during the decades of the Afghan conflict. And uh, it is my hope that such futures will be inclusive of uh, the rightful uh, stakeholders uh, in, in which I want to include also the, the curators, the archaeologists, uh, the students and the citizens of Afghanistan and of the Afghan diaspora. Mm. When I shared that I would be uh, on this uh, panel today with a senior Afghan colleague, he, he reminded me that he, and his colleagues in Afghanistan are aware that the Asian Art Museum also has other Afghan artifacts that may warrant uh, further investigation, for example, Gandharan art. But he was also keen that I share the necessity of developing creative exchanges and loan strategies between his museum 
and its counterparts in, in Europe and in North Africa. It's obvious to me that the Asian Art Museum is placing itself as the trailblazers of, among the trail, trailblazers of such new relationships. Um, I, I want to end saying that uncovering problematic histories in our museums is, uh, makes us very uncomfortable. And um, however, I think that uh, it is not enough. It is my personal hope that we venture into even more uncomfortable regions. And I will stop here, stop sharing my screen, and maybe we can continue in our conversation. These uh, and other issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's ask everybody to come back on screen. And Allison will spotlight all of our videos. One question that's in many people's minds is what is what would the museum like to say about what our thinking is with the, um, the, the panel as well as the other Afghan artifacts and uh, Jay or Rob, do you wish to provide some context on where we are? Yeah, maybe I will start with just a few general remarks and uh, Rob can talk more. I just want to use this opportunity to thank our panelists for very wide ranging as well as in-depth discussion of this uh, topic, which is very uncomfortable, but at the same time, extremely timely and important. And for uh, not only the practitioners in the field, but for the people involved, particularly the people of the local communities. And uh, so, you know, the, your topics, uh, some are, are really very broad strokes and the, but at the same time fundamentals issues including the very definition of uh, uh, heritage and heritage care and some are very specific including the Ghazni panels that our museum had the one and as well as you know other museums and if all, all the museum there are those problematic and questionable uh, objects that need a further inquiries so I hope that today's discussion not only will be useful for our museum, but for many other museums, as well as for the, all the interested uh, um, uh, people and in uh, other fields as well. For um, the, uh, we have started the learning journey about particularly the Ghazni panel in our possession the moment that we read uh, the uh, New York Times article. And I'd uh, like to in particular thank Martina for her very timely uh, advice and uh, rich information and we're continuing. We're also uh, having conversations with other uh, colleagues in other museums in the US, such as um, uh, uh, um, the Brooklyn Museum in, that we share similar uh, pieces. So on that note, maybe Rob, you can share with uh, the, our panelists and our audience uh, where we are. Uh, yes, thanks, Jay. Um, I don't know if people can hear me. But uh, hopefully, somewhat good. Thank you. Uh, the you know the New York Times article really triggered all of us to immediately uh, take take stock of what we know, and uh, we of course had Martina's earlier reports to us. Uh, but you know, having some immediate conversation and being able to uh, think through not necessarily the the legal aspects of uh, this panel, but really to focus on the ethical questions related to this panel uh, and related to other objects in our collection, I think has, has given us a new sense of, of sort of urgency with respect to uh, works like this that entered the collection uh, in the 1980s. And I think where we are today is really at, at the beginning steps. Um, I noticed among the the attendees today uh, is Mr. Rahimi from the uh, National Museum of Afghanistan in Kabul. And uh, he will be receiving a letter from our institution, I'm writing it right now, uh, asking to open a dialogue to discuss the future of the panel and to discuss a, a potential transfer of ownership to the people of Afghanistan. Um, we, of course, love the idea of the possibility of long-term loans between our institutions and the sharing of culture, because we all share a common mission goal uh, of spreading knowledge and information. Um, but we certainly understand and I think feel very, very wholeheartedly 
um, that we need to share that cultural understanding and knowledge and also respect the ownership, respect the property rights of those who we, who we display in our museum. And um, that sort of is, is the beginnings of our path. Um, I'm sure this is a many months, if not many years path that we will go down, uh, but hopefully all toward a, a more fair and, and understanding place. Does that kind of sum us up, Jay? Uh, thank you. Deb, uh, shall we uh, enter into the q and period? I'd love to hear more. I'm sure our audience can have lots of questions. Yes, um, so we could, we could ask some of the questions that we prepared. Um, and one that I know we wanted to talk about is other artists who are creating, in addition to Michael, uh, powerful work uh, responding to, you know, um, blood antiquities and, you know, the, the, the harm done to cultural, um, history. And, and, um, so I think, um, Zainab, you wanted to talk a lot, a little bit about that, if you could. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, Michael for his, um, amazing uh, presentation um, and for his work in general, um, because I didn't have an opportunity to say that. Um, and Michael's work has been so powerful, but I think that um, in the West, people are not really aware of what contemporary artists are doing in places like Iraq or Syria. And I wanted to point out uh, for those of you who are not aware, that in Iraq itself, um, response by contemporary artists to uh, the looting of antiquities and the destruction of cultural heritage were main themes of artistic production, beginning actually with the first Gulf War. So around 1990, 91, we began to see incredibly powerful works that respond to um, the looting and destruction of antiquities. Um, one of these artists who was working in the 1990s were incredibly powerful and these uh, were shown at exit uh, at Zineb, we're, um, we're not hearing you, and maybe you can economize by hiding your video and we can get your voice at least. Um, well, while she's coming back, there is um, there are some questions in the chat and one which was answered. Um, thank you, Stephanie, with your suggestion. And as someone who's responsible for training docents and having conversations with our docent community, we will definitely be diving into this. Uh, many of the docents actually at the Asian Art Museum were on the call this morning. So uh, Charita asks, um, how can those of us who are docents at museums raise awareness of these issues when we interact? I think a lot of docents are afraid to go there, if you will. A lot of museum staff are afraid to go there. Um, but it's our audiences are coming in with some assumptions about collections in museums and um, Sometimes those assumptions are with a very broad stroke. It's all ill-gotten gain. Um, and um, certainly there's a radical thought that maybe there's some truth to that, but, um, but how can we uh, more transparent, transparently talk about those things? So Stephanie typed a, a chat, but are there other models that you have seen at institutions where it really is on the front lines of their interpretation of their artworks? I mean, I would maybe ask Martina if she had a response to that because I'm not a curator, I'm a university professor. <laughs> but she probably has a much better uh, sense of that. Go ahead, Martina. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, I want to say something that I always uh, try to repeat to myself. Um, I, I'm in a very funny position here talking uh, on, uh, on these issues and uh, 
coming from uh, a large encyclopedic museum like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, but one thing that really helps me when I think of my work uh, is to, uh, and, and on how to communicate um, the complexities and subtleties of, uh, of our collection, of the history of our collection, um, is um, to keep the trust in, 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 in our visitors and in the viewers. Um, we sometimes tend to, um, you know, try to simplify our communication to make it very direct. Uh, um, it, is, uh, uh, it is not what our viewers, our, our visitors uh, want. Um, uh, and also it's not what they deserve, <laughs> I would say, as well. Um, visitors in museums uh, today, even more than in the past, uh, are uh, really uh, hungry in, in, in you know, understanding the complexities of our histories. And uh, we have to acknowledge those complexities. We, we have to acknowledge our role. I'm speaking here, of course, I, I want to say also that <laughs> everything I'm saying here is my personal opinion. So I'm, I'm not here a spoke person for, for the Met and not even for the Islamic art department of the Met. Another thing that uh, may be useful uh, to think of when, um, when communicating to, to visitors is uh, that uh, museums are not monolithic institutions. We, we, we disagree inside. <laughs> we have very different opinions and that's actually a richness. So until now, I hope that this uh, is something that is coming uh, more and more up uh, these days. Uh, uh, and it's something that we within the museum can can share. It's not a sense of it's not an element of weakness. In fact, it is the contrary. Does this is, uh, that really resonates to your me. question to the question of the docent? Yeah, that really resonates for for me that we've been having those conversations at the Asian Art Museum about elevating diverse voices from within the institution that aren't all, it's not no longer this museum voice as the primal um, presenting mode. Um, there are more questions in the chat. Should I continue with those, Jay? Or did you want to ask some of the, some of your questions? Well, sure, you know, I, uh, again, thanks. I think uh, the issue of how we can complicate uh, the uh, context yet convey the complexity and also the openness in different perspective in the museum setting is a is a very meaningful challenge and opportunity. Is that how yet we need to do so in a succinct way? That the understanding that you know people have the tools, but how in their way because learning is not only should happen in the museum. Or on the online world, I mean, it should be at home, it should be before visit, after, during visit, after visit. So how we can help develop this journey. But my question, and I think, I don't know if uh, uh, all of the panelists can hear, some are, are having uh, 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 seem to be connection difficulty, is that in the spirit of complicating the issues and, uh, and making ourselves more uncomfortable, because uh, I'm a museum, a professional most of my career, but I was a uh, I feel the archaeologist myself during part of my career, and I love to return to the field of excavation someday, maybe some after my retirement <laughs> years from now. So you know, my question is that um, uh, so it's, it's a simple one: is that looting of antiquities continues in a number of countries today, and not only in the countries that in the war and in the major conflict. And um, in the country that, um, you know, economically challenged and uh, underdeveloped, but in a country that is fast developing, let me use in China an example. I think uh, the underneath of us is all the value and the profit. You know, there, are one, there are different concrete motivations and factors, but seem to be universal is the idea of uh, profit and uh, the idea of uh, possessive values of antiquities. So um, the, the, in China, and 
field archaeology is developing very fast, but at the same time, the, uh, the illicit digging and the looting is also rampant. And typically, the uh, major archaeological sites and the, uh, uh, has two fates. One is that uh, the, the looters follow the archaeologists very closely. The second is that the often the case major archaeology site turned into tourist destination because of the commercial value, whether it's, you know, uh, so the commercial value expands the whole spectrum. So in this way, I feel the everybody is on this ecosystem had responsibility or some degrees of uh, retrospection. Even, you know, to us as archaeologists, you know, we, when we excavate, we call attention that we all understand, we understand there's a larger, higher idea of why we want to know about ancient past, the history, and how we can engage in the local community. At the same time, whatever we excavate, we also have to be selective. So that itself is a privilege in certain things over others. So how we can engage not only our fellow colleagues, but the local communities and the whole world in addressing these issues, particularly the looting that is going on. So um, that's my question. And I, you know, I hope that I'm not making everybody too uncomfortable. I have a few thoughts on that, but I, I actually would love to hear from Zainab if she's um, still there. I'm here. I'm just really afraid that I'll be disconnected, but I, I couldn't agree more with those comments. I thought those were brilliant. I'm going to switch my face off. Uh, I thought those were, can you hear me still? Yeah. I thought those were brilliant comments, in fact, and I think too often field archaeologists have set themselves aside and not taken responsibility and acted as though uh, collectors and museum professionals are the, the only people to blame. But archaeologists also have to sh shoulder some of the burden and some of the responsibility for um, what has happened. And I think archaeology, field archaeology, has um, a lot of self-reflection and a lot of hard work to do itself, um, which it has not done. Um, and in some respects, we might even geologists in my field, um, at, at least, um, doing that kind of serious introspection. Stephanie, what do you think? I, I just absolutely you put the, the exactly what I wanted to say, which is that, um, you know, all of us in this context are creators of heritage value, right? That's kind of what we're doing. When I excavate in Syria, I'm bringing objects out of the ground and by designating them as worthy of study, I'm working on the publication of, you know, this massive ceramics catalog from my 12 years of excavation there you know, by publishing these objects, by putting them out into the market, we become enmeshed in systems that create heritage value. And um, we need to think very carefully about what that means for, because these objects of heritage value, um, you know, they, they impact the lives of the people, often who are our colleagues and friends that we work with in the field. And I really feel that archeologists actually have a very special role to play in this process of um, heritage restitution and in this process of rethinking um, uh, what role we should be playing, precisely because we often work so closely with people in, uh, in the communities in which heritage is, in which value is being created. And, um, you know, different types of um, archaeological schemas, it, you know, in the past, the idea has simply been that you go to the country and essentially perform an extractive process. You're extracting, you know, sometimes in the past, we were literally extracting objects and taking them home. That doesn't happen uh, very often anymore. Um, almost never, thankfully. Um, but but we're still extracting publications, extracting careers, you know, I owe my much of my career to the time that I spent in Syria and the work that I did there. 
Um, so I owe an obligation then back to this country and the people of that country that, that gave me so much. And for me, that's a very personal obligation. I still have really deep relationships with people there who have been, you know, displaced by the conflict. I still work very closely with them to try to support them um, financially and, you know, in other ways as well um, to try to just do what I can on the personal level. It feels like, you know, infinitely small in the context of everything. Um, but also engaging with these really difficult questions of heritage on the um, on the the professional level for me is another I think really important way to try to push the field toward more accountability and toward moving toward a model that is more about restorative justice through heritage. Thank you. Well, we will definitely be relying on all of you to be on our team in this work. Um, we only have a couple um, yes. minutes left. Yes. Uh, is it possible to for me to ask a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, okay. I think um, again using uh, China example, so many many uh, sort of the Buddhist statutes and uh, uh, which were originally institute and the uh, specific locations were this were looted or purchased or in whatever manner left the uh, uh, China and dispersed in the and in museum of the Western world in particular. And so a uh, Chinese archeologist uh, uh, sort of uh, acknowledged that many Buddhist caves could never be restored and, and, uh, and in their original settings. So I think that is a very uh, sort of self-evident uh, ending. And, I was struck, um, I was really agree uh, about the restorative process. It's not only repatriation, but restorative. And one of the first steps, I think uh, some institutions are starting doing digital recreation. It's sort of a, in a different way that uh, Michael was doing, I think. Uh, but those, I think, efforts could go on parallel. So, uh, so how these days are, uh, uh, Preservation is considering digital tools in the region that you are studying to document the loss and recreate the size of uh, original appearance as part of the restorative uh, uh, process. So how we could use as museum, now speaking in the museum, using this kind of process as a tool for education. Stephanie, do you want to respond on this? Well, I feel like I've talked a lot, but I'll just quickly say that um, I think uh, these digital initiatives, I, I find them, I'll be frank, I find them really problematic because um, there's kind of this idea that somehow if you've archived this thing, if you've recreated this thing, you've saved it somehow, right? But, you know, while you might have, have preserved some information, um, you're not actually supporting this object's continuous existence in situ or, you know, in, in its country of origin. And I think that um, sometimes these are projects, first of all, the tremendous sums of money that are involved, um, I think could be put to much better use. So to tie back to that question of archeologists and their complicity and their role in this, um, you know, I would love to see initiatives where museums work together with archeologists who have those on the ground contacts in country um, to, to actually maybe leave behind some type of substantive benefit for the people who, um, who we have worked with in this region, right? So whether that has to do with, you know, preserving archaeological sites or the types of um, education in initiatives that people like Maura Kersel have pursued with Follow the Pots project in Petra. Um, there are a variety of different very creative ways um, uh, that, uh, that archaeologists and museums could be working collaboratively, um, not as they did in the 19th century, just in a merely extractive fashion, but actually toward um, initiatives that you know, that leave behind something meaningful for, for people once that archaeological mission has come to an end. Um, and I think that, that the only thing stopping us really is just getting together and talking and, and, and thinking creatively about what those solutions might be. There's a lot of smart people on, on all sides of this conversation. And, and of course, the main stakeholders should be people, you know, local people for whom the meaning and significance of these sites may not always line up with what the meaning and significance is in, uh, in Western countries. And so what I was trying to think through in terms of um, reframing the universal heritage idea is like, like, how can we expand our notion of actually what heritage is and means and, and how it might function quite differently outside of 
um, of this universalist uh, model. Just to give one quick example on the site where I worked, um, you know, there was a um, uh, an old uh, a 13th century madrasa, a kind of religious college where I worked that we had excavated. Um, and it had later on become an important burial ground for the people in the local village there. So they still revered that site, but much like Martina's examples, um, you know, they revere it in a way that, that doesn't quote unquote preserve the identical form and shape and space of the original monument at all. Right, but it's not necessarily for us to, to come in and say that it should be preserved in X form or, or Y form if it's meaningful to people in a particular way. Our role should be to try to understand the contemporary evolution of the significance of that site for, for living people. Yeah, that's so interesting to learn about how the um, sites are really evolving and to, um, to honor and respect that is so important. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. There's there's still some interesting questions um, and one that I think we can't leave on the table. So if, if people are willing to stay a few more minutes, I think we should ask this one. The Mahmud of Ghazni invaded India 17 times and destroyed many temples and plundered the cities and towns using the treasures to build his capital. When we talk about reparations from Western countries to places like Afghanistan, how can we also consider the considerable damage done to other major monuments in India? And uh, can they be considered in this process of reparations? Um, shall I step in here? I, um, this is a very interesting question because it always comes up when we speak of uh, of Mahmoud, the, who was this Ghaznavid Sultan, end of the 11th uh, beginning, uh, end of 10th beginning of, uh, of 11th century, who uh, his, the historiography tells us about these expeditions to, to India. And there is a lot of boasting about, uh, you know, the, the violence. But we also have to consider um, um, both how we read and present the past, but also who are the other um, actors who are telling us about, about the past. And this is a narrative that uh, in this specific uh, historical moment is uh, the narrative of uh, um, Hindu nationalists uh, to insist uh, on, 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 on the military and, and violent aspects of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Mahmoud's uh, um, rule. Um, I, I think uh, the following, we, we do not have to erase any aspect of the past. Uh, this involves both uh, our, um, you know, for starting from the past of our, uh, of our institutions. Um, when we, uh, uh, exhibit uh, objects in museums, we have to find ways of uh, creatively include, you know, also conflictual uh, um, visions of, 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 of the past. Mm. One way of doing this is uh, um, to consider the multiple lives of the objects in, in our labels. So in um, the largest majority of museums, for example, that are exhibiting uh, marbles from Razni, they only mention, uh, we usually only mention their original moment, the moment in which these objects uh, were created for either the, the palace of Sultan Masud III or other buildings that we don't know yet because we're not uh, excavated. Mm. However, mm, the, the panel, for example, now in San Francisco had a very short life in that palace maybe a couple of decades. And uh, instead it had a very long life uh, as an element uh, uh, of, uh, of a sacred, of, of, a, of a funerary place uh, to, to enhance this, this, uh, this tomb, to, to make it, uh, to elevate the, the space. Um, why are we erasing this part of the history from, from our labels? Uh, is it less, uh, uh, important to us? So is it because uh, it is conflicting with our own uh, uh, history? <laughs> um, 
and so um, and the same also for you know different visions about uh, about the past. Uh, I think that we cannot erase uh, uh, violences uh, in uh, in any way. We shouldn't. We should highlight them, and we should uh, also look at the violences uh, in our own way of telling of telling the past. It's obvious today in the scholarship, and it's. Uh, slowly coming also in the museum world as well, that um, we need to have a critical stance towards our own uh, historiography, the way we talk about the past, the way we have, a we, we were looking at the past with, with our lens. And so we are choosing to see some things and choosing not to see other things. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Jay, do you wanna say any final words? I think we should probably wrap it up. We're almost 10 minutes over time. And yeah, but it's just, uh, you know, uh, it's so enlightening. And also I think uh, it's, it's a really had the nature of an ongoing uh, uh, conversation. And this uh, uh, ongoing conversation is very much uh, uh, need a, a much larger effort. So I hope that what we do here um, as um, holding Asia Art Museum's own actions and own thinking process accountable to all our stakeholders. Same time, I hope that the many other organizations will particip uh, uh, participate in debate and discussion. And only through those kind of open dialogue and, uh, and uh, really uh, deeply and broadly contextualize the conversations, I think will hopefully guide our um, actions forward in a more meaningful uh, in a more ethically sound and and uh, uh, in uh, uh, in a way that if I, one I may call universal is that to really have the people's particular people whose voices are not uh, had the opportunity to be raised that's a voice of local communities be really heard and and um, shared so thank you our panelists for your work and uh, thank our audience for your participation thank for my team, for your behind the scene, as well as on front stage, Deb, that you are, and Rob, uh, for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it, um, this was a really great and productive conversation. It's great to see the Asian Art Museum stepping out into this, I know, very difficult and challenging sort of topic. And um, I hope there are many more such conversations in the future. We do as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.